So this is my to hacker podcast and we have a very special guest today. So thank you for accepting my invitation, Patrick. This is Patrick. Yeah. Again. Of course, Peter. Thanks very much. I think we will have plenty to chat about. Yes, sir. And uh, first of all, how do you pronounce your name? Because that's the, that's the number one question I always get. And, and I'm sure you get it, this too. It's, it's McKeown, but uh, don't worry too much about it. I've, I've heard many interpretations of it, and I'm, it doesn't bother me too much. So. <laughs> okay, so, so now we have uh, the official pronunciation. Yeah, that's, McKeown. That's cool. <laughs> Thank you. So first of all, you know, I'm thinking about talking about two things, which is one is buteco breeding naturally, mm -hmm. and the other is also oxygen advantage. Mm -hmm. But what is, um, you know, uh, in the light of the last two, three months, do you see that people are more and more interested in generally in breathing? Yes. No, there's no question. I have seen my own work and I'm sure you've seen your work. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of inquiries that we're getting in, the amount of signups and the amount of sales as a result of it has increased dramatically. So something has happened in the last three months. Mm -hmm. I remember I just, I was doing a podcast for COVID. This was in around the 20, 25th of March. Mm -hmm. And it was totally amateurist. Mm -hmm. I did it through Zoom. Um, I was going to talk for about 20 minutes, giving people practical tips. And I put the video, I, the reason I put the video eventually out on YouTube, because the lighting was bad, the sound was bad, everything was bad. I had no structure. It was all mm -hmm. over the place. I put it on YouTube and it has nearly 700,000 hits. And that has been the single most popular video that I've ever put out on YouTube. Um, since in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I think COVID has captured people's imagination. And people now for the first time are realizing that breathing is very important, but that's normal. You only consider your breathing when it's not right, when it's not up to par. And people who think that their breathing is fine, they won't give it any attention. But when their breathing goes wrong, it's really vital to start looking into it. And now is the time. But, but the difficulty with this, and I agree with that, what you say, but, but I guess the difficulty in this, mm -hmm. uh, and we are also examples for that, that when it's, it's uh, so it's, it's pretty much a hidden cause to many yes. things. And yes. when you have um, some, some, type, some, some type of not breathing related issue, we think, but it is probably breathing issue. So then nobody will point you to the specialist to say like, oh, by the way, you're, let's say I had eczema. Yes. Since I'm practicing Buteco, it's gone. It's, it was yes. never gone, but yeah. it's gone. Yeah. And yeah. I know if my CP is about 30 or 40, it's not coming back. Yeah. So yeah. in other words, there comes the question. Uh, so, so, how do you connect the, the dots or how do you make the doctors connect the dots? You know, if you look at the whole history of breathing and chronic hyperventilation, mm -hmm. it was first noted back in the American Civil War with an American physician, De Costa, and he called it De Costa syndrome or irritable heart. And it was basically soldiers returning from the front line. Mm -hmm. These soldiers were exposed to long-term stress they had irritability, they had fatigue, they had breathlessness, they had paresthesia, they had different symptoms related to the change to their breathing patterns as a result of long-term stress. And then in 1937, researchers called it chronic hyperventilation syndrome. But in the 1950s and 60s, medical doctors said that this wasn't their field. So they handed it to psychiatry. Mm. And psychiatry said it wasn't their field so they handed it back to medical doctors. And as a result, it fell between the two stools. That chronic hyperventilation, and it took a few different notable individuals working in the medical profession to really shed light on this. One was Dr. Claude Lum. He's a chest, chest physician from Papward Hospital in Cambridge in the UK. And he called it the fat file syndrome. He said that there's a group of patients and they are going from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor and all that's happening is that their file is getting fatter. And he said that the size of the file is more important than the contents therein. Mm -hmm. These individuals have symptoms that can be affecting different parts of the body. The doctor is normally thinking that the person is a hypochondriac. The doctor is failing to see chronic hyperventilation 
because the doctor is not trained to look at breathing pattern disorders. And here's the thing, Peter, you know, and I know that breathing pattern disorders affect quite a significant part of the population. And for those individuals, it's been mainly overlooked. So there are thousands of individuals with anxiety, with depression, with PTSD, with asthma, with COPD, with um, hypertension, hypotension, sleep apnea, um, lower back pain. Females, you know, during the monthly cycle, that can have a huge impact on their breathing, increasing pain, pain perception is higher, rheumatoid arthritis, and the list goes on. And I'm not saying that this is a cure-all, it's not. But your breathing and the quality of our breathing can influence so many systems in the human body. And I think the other thing is, Peter, that people say, yeah, my breathing is fine. Because all they think is, well, I'm, what can I do? The only way I can change my breathing is take this big breath. The nonsense that has been spread throughout the Western world and now even the Eastern world. But yoga, when it was traditionally developed, the yogi masters never talked about breathing hard. They always talked about breathing light. And for breathing to get some attention, it really needs an individual and especially breathing instructors to know the depth about breathing. It's not just about taking this big breath. There is so much that we can go, the detail that we can, you know, when you can think of what can we do when we change breathing patterns, we can influence our blood circulation, we can improve oxygen delivery, we can increase blood flow to the brain, we can improve the temperature of our hands by virtue of improving circulation, we can open up the airways, both the lungs and the nose, we can improve sleep, we can improve energy levels, concentration, and a lot of these benefits we can get very quickly. And that's by tapping into different dimensions of the breath and just simple breathing exercises to improve those dimensions. So I think finally there is some awareness happening. Um, which is the difficulty is if you are checking some of the, the scientific literature, they talk about a very low number of uh, people who, who might have this kind of problem. So normally I'm seeing about three to 9% somewhere, somewhere in, in the ballpark. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, there's one study, a Cochrane review back in 2013, that said it was 9.5% of the general population. Mm -hmm. But in, that's in kind of in the general population. So 10% say in around. But in the asthma population, it increases to 30% in the literature. Now, personally, I have to say it's going to be much higher. Mm -hmm. But in the anxiety population and panic disorder, it's as high as 80%. So mm -hmm. there's no doubt that certainly in certain sectors of the population, yes. that breathing pattern disorders are, are much higher. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because just there's, no, there's very little awareness out there. Like if you were to talk to a medical doctor, how should you breathe? Should it be through the nose or through the mouth? the doctor would probably have no opinion whether breathing should be, even on the simple basis, even on the most fundamental thing, should breathing be through the nose or should breathing be through the mouth? And I'll always use the example. I have my little anatomical model here. If you look at the shape of the human mouth here, there is absolutely no part of the mouth that plays any role in respiration. None, zero. So how on earth could the mouth be the orifice that we are breathing through. And if you look at the space devoted to the nose and you have nasal turbinates and you have cilia and you have nitric oxide and you've got a mucous membrane and you've got you know, regulating volume and all of the benefits with nasal breathing. But yet, I have been in, I remember having a debate. I was at a medical conference in Chicago and I was speaking about the importance of nasal breathing. And one doctor told me, stood up, in the audience and said it didn't matter a difference whether you breathe it through your mouth or through your nose. Now, God Almighty, what's going on here? So, uh, about about five six months ago, I put up a, an article on the on the Facebook, and so I said, of course, it was a little bit provo provocative the, the the remark and the title, but I said, like, do you want to have uh, better looking and more clever kids? Yes. And it was very funny. So they, many people shared, like I'm talking about thousands probably, but of course some people felt offended. 
uh, yes. with this one, which is okay. I can handle that. But but in your opinion, <clears throat> so so of course everybody's own kid is the nicest and and smartest, and that, that I got it. But if we are not paying attention to our kids' breathing habits, is that possible we are robbing them long term? Yes. Both in education and probably in aesthetics as well, and yes. and life quality generally. I would say no child will ever achieve their inherited potential unless they breathe through their nose. Mm -hmm. And that's a statement that I don't make willy nilly. And the reason being is because I was the mouth breathing kid. Mm -hmm. And even with myself, I have craniofacial changes that once you develop them, you have them for the rest of your life. My nose is bent because my maxilla is too set back. Mm -hmm. My mandible is too set back. My airway is totally compromised. I have a high palate. I, have over, I had overcrowding of teeth. I had to get my jaws gently rewidened. My sleep was absolutely dismal going through school. I was falling asleep in the class. And here's the thing. We know that children with mouth breathing are at a greater risk of poor sleep quality. And children with poor sleep quality, they have 10 times the risk of learning difficulties. And if you look at, say, Karen, Karen Bonnock's study in Stratford-upon-Avon in the UK, 11,000 children over an eight year period. And from that, mouth breathing is a contributory factor to sleep disorder breathing. Children with sleep disorder breathing, which includes snoring. These children, if untreated by the age of eight, they had a 40% increased risk of special education needs. And the reason being is because, yes, as adults, we know, that the, we know the importance of a quality night's sleep. And if we don't have it, we wake up tired. But we have to bear in mind, children's brains are developing during those formative years. And if those children don't get quality night's sleep, it's not just that they wake up tired, it's not just that it's linked to ADHD, it's not just that their behavior is impacted, their academics, but their brain development is impacted. And this is translated into life. But I think there's enough research there. You know, we have to ask the question, when does science really come to a conclusion um, this has been debated since 1909. And I've seen, you know, if you go into Google and if you put in dental cosmos, mouth breathing malocclusion, there was an article written back in 1909. That article describes children who are mouth breathing. The face is dull and expressionless because the face is sinking downwards. The jaws are set back. The face is long. The face is flat. The jaws are narrow. That individual is going to have a compromised face. And yes, you can ask, well, you know, are these children going to be less attractive? Yes, unfortunately they are. And there is, genetics is going to play a, a role in this. And it was a dentist back in the 1980s who wrote that book called Why Raise Ugly Kids? And it was all about breathing through the nose. And I know, you know, parents can get offended, but listen, why not teach your child something that's innate and simple and no side effects and the benefits are enormous? And there is a little bit of PC out there. I remember my book, The Oxygen Advantage, was going to get published. Yes. And I'm not sure, was it the UK publisher or the US? I think it was the UK publisher. And I had a chapter about craniofacial growth in it and the importance of nasal breathing. And the publisher contacted me and they says, Patrick, we can't include this chapter in the book. And I says, why can't you include this chapter in the book? And they said, because the reader will get upset. I said, this isn't about the reader. This is about the reader's children. This is about the next generation. At least we can start helping to prevent the negative effects from mouth breathing with this generation. And 25 to 50% of studied children are persistently mouth breathing. Now, there have been some leading authorities getting behind this. Dr. Christian Guimano. Yes. Stanford-based medical doctor, pioneer in sleep medicine, coined the phrase obstructive sleep apnea, developed the apnea hypopnea index, one of the founding fathers of sleep medicine. He quote, the only valid and complete and correct, um, the only valid and complete correction of pediatric sleep disorder breathing is restoration, both during wakefulness, is restoration of nasal breathing both during wakefulness and sleep. And I've heard him get up in medical conferences and I've heard him talk to his colleagues, doctors, you've talked about everything in the room about improving quality of sleep. 
but you have missed the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. and the elephant is the importance of nasal breathing. So we have the founding father who has now since passed away, um, and before his death, he published several papers, many papers, on the critical importance of restoring nasal breathing. But it's going to take 20 years for that information to trickle down to general practitioner level. Mm -hmm. And probably one of the reasons is it is very difficult to commercial. It's very difficult to make money from it. It's very difficult. You cannot patent nasal breathing. You cannot put it, you can put a trademark in the brand. There's no pill. There is no, there's, there's no pill. You can't scale it. It is, and it's unfortunate that, you know, the health of our children and of course adults is, is often influenced more by the money that's going to be generated as opposed to the benefits to that individual. So I had a, a client yesterday uh, for uh, personal training and he's a dentist. And uh, I haven't seen him because of the, of course, uh, because of the quarantine, I haven't seen him for like three months. So he comes back, he lost some weight. He feels amazing. Um, he, he says like he's one of the fittest ever in his life. Uh, guess what we did? He started to do Buteyko, of course. And uh, so, I, so I asked him about what happened. So he's very happy. And he also claims that uh, he's already started to work. And he said, uh, uh, due to the Buteyko, he started to handle uh, the patients different way. Meaning, he said like this, my work is 10% technical stuff and 90% of connection to the person. So he let me work. And he said, I figured out in this relationship with the, the patient, breathing is key. So I, first I teach them how to breathe they getting relaxed so I can work. Yes. So what I'm seeing here, and also it's a question like, so we have many of the gatekeepers who, who can see early signs. Yes. Dentist, on, on, uh, orthodontist, parents, mm -hmm. uh, teachers. So do, do you see that the same, same way? That, that these people don't see the signs, only the very late signs when it's, I'm not saying it's late, but it's, uh, it's more difficult. Yes, I think there's many occupations. I think teachers are in a tremendous capacity to identify mouth breathing in the childhood population. And surely they will see at some point that children who are mouth breathing, these kids don't have the concentration and don't have the academic ability. Now, I have to say, it doesn't affect all children the same. Mm -hmm. And I often give my example to, to parents. I was bright in primary school, which is our junior school. I was very much at the top of the class. But it was when I went to high school, I went from the top of the class right down to the bottom of the class. So I was bright up until about 11 years of age. And in high school, from 12 years of age up until 16, 17, I, it was crazy. To the point that I left school in 1988 at age 14. Now, I left school and I went working in a nearby in a shop that I'd been working in since I was 11. And I worked for one year. And then I went back to school. And I don't know what it was, but... You know, I then was very driven to achieve good grades. But for me to get my grades in fifth and sixth year, which is the end of high school, I had to study 12 hours a day. And that was the difference. You know, so teachers are in an, in an absolutely wonderful position to see this. And teachers could be bringing in simple little class on biology, the importance of nasal breathing, how it increases oxygen uptake in the blood, how it increases oxygen delivery to the tissues, how it increases blood flow to the brain, how it improves your sleep, how it improves your dental health. Like children who are mouth breathing, they have dry mouths, they will have more problems with their gums, they will have increased dental cavities, increased bad breath, and forward head posture, all of these things. And again, it sounds like it's a bit of a cure-all, but there's evidence supporting this. And yes, the evidence can be thin because Again, the research on breathing, you know, it is starting to catch up. And what we have noticed over the last, say, 20 years, um, some of the science is starting to catch up. To give you an example, we use breath all the time. The control pause is part of Buteyko method, used for 50 years. But now in sleep medicine, one of the phenotypes for obstructive sleep apnea, paper since 2018 by Harvard medical doctor Luciano Messino, and he uses breath all the time to measure loop gain in obstructive sleep apnea. Here is a condition that is epidemic around the world, that 30% of the individuals with obstructive sleep apnea have high loop gain. Doctors had no way of measuring it, and now they realize that 
breath-hold time is an indicator of loop gain. If you have a low control pause, a low breath-hold time, you have high loop gain. And if you have high loop gain, anatomical intervention doesn't work in sleep apnea. So coming back to it, yeah, I can understand it from a teacher's point of view. It has to happen from the top down. But the top down is mainly driven by the medical profession. And doctors have not yet picked up on the importance of nasal breathing. Mm -hmm. Not all dentists have picked up on it. Not all orthodontists have, but there are some absolutely amazing dentists and doctors and orthodontists in their field. But these are the innovators. These are the individuals who are looking into something with their eyes wide open. They're spotting that there is a link here and they want to investigate it further. We have to bear in mind, Peter, not everybody within the occupation has the same mindset. There are some individuals who spot that things are just not quite right. Yes, I got my training, but my training doesn't totally answer this question. And those individuals are the ones that are most progressive. And then you will have a few individuals and probably the vast majority of people. They're just, they've done their training, they sit back and they just apply the same techniques over and over and over. And they don't look outside the box. They don't look at from a multidisciplinary point of view and they don't spot these things. So I think people can be resistant to change. And when I've talked to the funny thing about dentists and doctors and um, orthodontists, the ones that were most progressive and how they found a connection between breathing and dental health and craniofacial development, they found it when they started to work with their own children. That's when they found it. Uh -huh. Because they see their child, the child is overcrowding of teeth, the child has got crooked teeth. So traditionally, maybe some orthodontists will say, well, the teeth are too big, so we need to extract teeth. Why on earth would you make the child's mouth smaller? So there's not enough room for the tongue. So the tongue is going to fall into the airway to increase the risk of sleep apnea for the rest of that child's life. Uh -huh. And some parents as dentists were obviously a little bit hesitant. Well, I don't want to extract two or four teeth. Nature has gave us 32 teeth as adults. We should be holding on to these. And these dentists then said, well, is it the problem that the teeth are too big or is it the problem that the jaws are too small? Let's let, let, gently... Let me ask a question. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, you're all right. Because I know you are very deep into this whole subject. So, uh, so if we think about the human uh, anthropology, yes. do we see that, that this kind, type of crowding, let's say, uh, 800 years ago, a thousand of years ago, or even no. even 15,000 years ago, is there any crowding where, well, well the, that person has to be tortured because they have to remove, I mean, does it make any sense? It makes no sense. And it doesn't happen in the animal world. Um, there's very few naturally wild animals with overcrowding of teeth. Yes, of course, dogs, because we've inbred them and crossbred them and ah, messed them up the as well. And that, we, we created yes. that bread, right? <laughs> Yeah, and the poor bulldog has no airway and he's got sleep apnea and he's snoring. So he's like the owner, you know, in many instances. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the work of, there's a pediatric dentist called Dr. Kevin Boyd, who is also an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. And he said that it was really with the, this, the switch to commercialization of farming. When we were hunter-gatherers, absolutely, we had no overcrowding of teeth. And if you go into a natural history museum in Budapest, if you see skulls there, you will see that the skulls have this really wide arch, that the maxilla is very much U-shaped, mm -hmm. and there's good forward growth as well. So there's plenty of room for the tongue and the mouth. The first documented cases of overcrowding of teeth only happened about 400 years ago. And this is from Professor John Mew, M-E-W, mm -hmm. and he's based in the UK. Now he has been saying for 50 years, now he, his father was a dentist. He's now 91 years of age. His father was a dentist. He trained as a dentist. He also trained as an orthodontic surgeon. He also trained as an orthodontist. And he has been saying that the orthodontic profession really needs to change their stance in terms of the development of the face. But because see, he's, he's saying this for 50 years. 50 years he's been saying it. And, 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 and the question is, like me as a parent or, yes. or somebody who is also a parent, like, do we have 20 years until the evidence-based medicine comes out and says like, yep, there is connection? Or because what I see, it's mostly uh, engineering problem. 
yes. type of change. So yes. it's, it's not a medical problem. It's it's simply so. So that's one of the reasons I like to work with engineers because you know they are always asking the right questions. Let's put it this yeah way. for sure. Okay, but but this is getting sometimes out of hand of because and and I also wanted to ask you because I know you are working with top athletes, mm -hmm. uh, many of the high level Olympic athletes. So we assume that they they are better in of course they're better in many ways i mean these are superhumans but but are they breathing better than than the average in terms of anatomical structure i don't think an individual will reach the heights of elite sports unless they've got a good airway mm -hmm. and again we'll just kind of have a look at this to explain it so we're looking at the size of the airway, the diameter of the airway, mm -hmm. which is basically a pipe. Mm -hmm. And an engineer will always understand that, yes, we're looking at the diameter of the pipe, but we also need to consider flow. And we're looking at the space at the back of the nose. You know, is the, is the nasal cavity, is, it, is the jaw, is the maxilla here far forward enough that there's enough room at the back of the nose for the individual to breathe through the nose, especially during childhood. We're looking at the, air, the airway space at the back of the mouth, and we're also looking at the size of the throat itself. A good airway is the size of your thumb. That's all it is. It's the size of a garden hose pipe. And a bad airway is the size of a big pen. Now, can you imagine an elite athlete who is breathing maybe 50 breaths per minute, and each breath can be as big as three liters, the tidal volume three liters, that they can be breathing 150 liters of air per minute. Can you imagine them trying to breathe through that? Uh -huh. It couldn't be possible. Uh -huh. Could not be possible. So no athlete. The only exception is probably is Michael Phelps. And the reason being is because he had such tremendous genetic makeup. He's got a long slender body and he's swimming. And swimming is about conservation of the breath. The, the body is against the water. The water is pressing against the individual. There's a restriction to their breathing. They're able to tolerate high levels of carbon dioxide. Their breathing is lighter for the given intensity of physical exercise. Because a swimmer, a swimmer needs to have good breathing because every time that they turn in the water to get a breath, they lose propulsion. So you need to be a swimmer like a seal, like a dolphin, streaming through, you know, going through the water which such streamline, but if you're turning to take that breath, you're losing that, you're losing speed, and you get caught out. But if you look, I think it's no coincidence that, I am, you know, most athletes are very good looking individuals, girls and fellas, they're, they're very, very attractive. That's not a coincidence. Now there's a couple of exceptions, but that's not a, a coincidence. These individuals are functionally better. They've got a better development of the face and a better development of the face we attract, we are attracted to our mates based on looks. No question about it. You know, there is something about physical attractiveness when, when a man meets a, a woman or a woman meets a man, that they, they attract each other, that at least that individual must have a similar physical attractiveness to the other individual. Uh -huh. Physical attractiveness is healthy. If you're an attractive looking individual, if you were to look back through the generations, and probably nutrition plays a role here, that individuals who had really good nutrition throughout the generations are better looking people. And if you look at countries, the countries with better food, the countries with um, more resources are generally better looking people. And I see our own country, Ireland, and this is not to say that all Irish people are ugly looking or anything like that, but I'm gonna say this, we were colonized. And as a result of colonization, Irish people were put on the worst land. We were fed potatoes or we had to grow potatoes because we had no resources and all of the good food was exported out of the country. So we had generations of Irish people over an 800 year period eating very poor nutrition. That has to come true in the population. So, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting, you know, the whole craniofacial development and you, you could ask the question, well, why has John Mew been talking about this for 50 years and nobody has, has considered exactly. it? And the, reason, the question here is, I didn't get the answer until I read this book. This book is just out. This is written by a guy called James Nestor. Yes, I and read it. He's, you've read it. Yes, sir. So when you go to the footnotes, 
He didn't include it in the main part of the book. But when you go to the footnotes, he gives a reason that Mew's colleagues were critical because Mew was critical of the orthodontic profession. And because Mew was giving out about the orthodontic profession, the orthodontic profession didn't want to take on board his ideas. That is crazy. So it wasn't necessarily that what Mew was saying was wrong, but it was because Mew was criticizing how orthodontics was being done. And on that basis, they didn't want to know. Yeah, it's the, the other very interesting uh, subject regarding to breathing, how breathing is affecting sleeping, right? So, yes. so this is something uh, like a, a domino effect, basically. So we always talk about if you want to have uh, a, a good training, your sleep has to be good the day before. But if you want to have a good sleep, your nose has to be clean and you need nose breathing. So, so the whole thing, when we work with athletes, goes back day or days before yes. as a preparation. So here comes the thing about obstructive sleep apnea. And you said something very interesting last time uh, you've been here at Budapest, that, that there are people who has many incidents, short incidents, and there are people who are almost like two minutes, which is crazy. Yes. But generally, we think that two minutes person is in danger. Yes. However, research shows that the, the very small breath holds are the problems when we sleep. Yes. Can, can you uh, explain yeah. that? Yeah, of course. Um, sleep apnea has changed. The whole recognition of sleep apnea, traditionally it was recognized that it was primarily an anatomical issue, that the airway was compromised and as a result the individual stopped breathing during sleep. And they can stop breathing due to a number of reasons. The soft palate can fall in against the throat or the epiglottis or the tongue can fall into the airway or the throat itself can collapse. And the throat can collapse partially or it can collapse fully. And when the throat collapses, it's if the throat collapses completely, that the, air would, that the individual stops breathing. During that time, their blood oxygen saturation will start to drop and carbon dioxide levels start to increase. And at some point, this takes the person out of that deeper sleep, so it arouses them. Now, the effect that the arousal has will depend on the individual. One of the phenotypes now that's been recognized is called arousal threshold. An arousal threshold is how light or deep a sleeper is that individual. So if you have, say, somebody with insomnia, and insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea very much go together. 67% of people with obstructive sleep apnea have insomnia. So you have somebody who is a light sleeper. And if their airway just collapses, just even for a few seconds, but that can be enough to wake them out of sleep, what they are experiencing all night long is sleep fragmentation. And that sleep fragmentation has, is a greater risk of causing mortality than the individual who is a deep this sleeper. Is, I'm sorry, this is all cause mortality, right? So it can be because of diabetes, uh, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, anything basically. Well, they isolated the factors. They isolated the factors, other factors. So they looked primarily at the impact that obstructive sleep apnea was having. Mm -hmm. And it was found, and it was a fairly, a very high population. I think it was 11,000 individuals. And it was over a number of years. And it was published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. So it's a journal by the American Transit Society that it's individuals who were light sleepers with relatively mild obstructive sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. These aren't the guys who are stopping breathing for a minute and a half that are dying. Mm -hmm. This is the individual who has so, got so much sleep fragmentation all night long that they're not getting down into that deep, deep quality of sleep. Sure. And you know what it really shows? The power of sleep and the importance of sleep quality. And nose breathing is going to be a big part of that because if the mouth is open, if we have a stuffy nose and the mouth is open, we are 1.8 times more likely to have a sleep problem. Mm -hmm. Now, besides, um, besides obstructive sleep apnea, which is definitely plaguing the society, there's another thing which is all happening a lot, working with uh, uh, spine surgeons myself, so, which is lower backache. Yes. Right, which, which can be, of course, uh, traumatic. So somebody did something goofy. I got yes. it. 
that's yep. me. Uh, or or somebody who is just doesn't get it. Like suddenly my back hurts. I've never done anything. And do you see connections yes. in, in research and also experience from your, your patients or clients that yes. it might be? Really? I think there is. And I think there's a very significant connection. I haven't put it out there for back pain. And the reason being is because I wanted to get the research myself. And I'm currently writing a new book and Back pain is one of the topics that is brought into the book. So I looked at the work of an osteopath called Leon Chato, C-H-A-I-T-O-W. He is. And I think he's since passed on as well. It's unfortunate that these such highly experienced individuals, you know, and that's, that's life. But he spoke about the connection between lower back pain and breathing. And we have to consider that the diaphragm breathing muscle at the base of the ribs at the base of the chest, of the thorax, is not just for respiration. Mm -hmm. That when we take a breath in, the diaphragm is moving downwards. And in the movement of the diaphragm, it's generating intra-abdominal pressure. And this is causing and um, um, helping with stability of the spine. Yes. But if we have fast upper chest breathing, we're not having that low breathing and we're not having the proper functioning and movement of the diaphragm. And as a result, the spine isn't getting the support that it needs. And this then can contribute <clears throat> to lower back pain. So I think that the, um, from what I can remember just offhand, I think it's as high as 100%. Now, 100% of individuals with lower back pain having poor breathing patterns. Mm -hmm. Now, you could ask the question, is it the lower back pain which is feeding into the poor breathing patterns? Or is it the poor breathing patterns which is feeding back into the lower back pain? And there could be a cyclical loop there, but at the same time, doesn't it make sense in terms of core muscle function that when we look at the core, we should consider it as a box. You've got the pelvic floor at the bottom. You've got the diaphragm at the top. You've got the abdominals to the front. You've got the spinal muscles to the back and that the diaphragm and the, the role it plays. Again, it's not just for respiration. It's for that stabilization. And I suppose the best way to, for people to think about it is if you were lifting up a weight, Typically, what the individual will do is as they lift the weight, they will breathe in and hold their breath. And as they breathe in, their diaphragm is moving downwards. And it's almost that the abdomen is bracing the abdomen, that it's like a pneumatic balloon, that it's providing that support. So there's where breathing comes in, because the generation of that intra-abdominal pressure is dependent on the diaphragm moving properly. So at the end of the exhalation, that the diaphragm is moving back up to its resting position. And it's the distance between the top of the diaphragm in its resting state to the lower ribs, which determines the zone of apposition, which in turn is influencing intra-abdominal pressure. So I think the biomechanics of breathing are very, very important. And here's the key. Many people are talking about the importance of diaphragmatic breathing. How many of them are talking about nose breathing? And unless we achieve nose breathing, the nose is connected with the diaphragm. And we also have to be considering how do you breathe during sleep? How do you breathe during walking? How do you breathe during rest? How is your breathing 24-7? That it's not just a few exercises that you're doing in a studio, and then when you leave the studio, you forget all about your breathing. No, your work, you're looking at your clients, and you are interested in how your client is breathing 24-7, because we carry our breath with her all day long, we're using it all day long, and how we breathe during rest influences how we breathe during sleep, and how we breathe during rest influences how we breathe during physical exercise. So I think it's important to look at that as well. And it's many times basically critical thinking and reverse engineering. So basically somebody comes to me and says, let's say it's my athlete and says, oh, by the way, my back hurts. I'm not a doctor, so I cannot treat him, of course. But I can say like, mm, let me see what is your boat score. And the boat score is normally 15, yes. 13, 12. And I'm like, okay, so why don't you lie on your back and let me see how do you breathe when you are breathing on your own? And they are chest breathers. And then yes. we start to implement nose and diaphragm, uh, diaphragm breathing. And suddenly they come up and like, well, actually my back is much better now. What happened? Yeah. Right? Yes. So, so many times what we are looking for is when the, the research comes out on this very specific problem, when we just have to use critical thinking like, well, if you are doing all the time this in every breathing, you yep. you are definitely 
uh, not in a physiological position for your spine. Let's put it this way. Yes. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. this is the, the spine people are loading with pressing, pulling in the gym. And then they might get more muscular. That's great. But in the same time damaged. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that, that I see as a, as a, as a great problem. Now we got into recovery uh, because we started to talk about um, mm -hmm. uh, sleeping. So how do you see the connections between the, the breathing and um, the, the vagus nerve? Because I'm sure this is, you also uh, started to, to many years ago, probably started to go into this subject. No, it's actually only recently. This is like, we're all stuck in our own little silos. And with Buteco, I was all Buteco for so many years. It was actually the oxygen advantage that I felt that some of the reins were taken off that I could start exploring. Um, the vagus nerve is amazing, you know, and it's amazing this nerve that's wandering throughout the body. And a lot of the feedback is from the body back to the brain, 80% of that feedback. Mm -hmm. So you have this nerve innervating many different organs of the body, communicating back to the brain. And of course, then the brain is, is you know, directing them back to the rest of the body. But we can influence the vagus nerve, we can stimulate it through the breath. And the optimal breath is six breaths per minute, 5.5 to six breaths per minute. But as our bolt score or control pause, which is basically the same thing, as it's increasing, our breathing rate is naturally becoming slower. And as our breathing rate is naturally becoming slower, if then we bring in cadence breathing to six breaths per minute, but without sacrificing the biochemistry, which is important. Sure. So we could do all three. We could look at taking in light breathing, which is about the biochemistry, slow breathing, which is cadence breathing or paced breathing, and deep breathing, which is using the lower regions of the lungs, that a deep breath doesn't have to be necessarily a big breath. But when we slow down the breathing rate to six breaths per minute, it's an optimal cadence for stimulating the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve in turn then is going to increase what's called heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is the variation between and the timing between heartbeats, the orto or intervals. And there is a link between our breathing and the timing of the heartbeat. And the synchronization of our breathing and the timing of the heartbeat is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And this has been known for, I believe, for about 200 years. That therapist used to, to indicate the functioning of the individual's autonomic nervous system because it's heart rate variability, which gives you a good indicator of vagal tone. Like, how can you measure whether your vagus nerve is working it the way it should do, whether it's, you know, generating sufficient traffic? So HRV is a measure, it's considered to be a measure of vagal tone. So on the breath in, you should notice that the heartbeat is getting faster. And on the breath out, because the breath out is parasympathetically, parasympathetically driven, that the heartbeat is getting, the timing between beats is getting longer or the heartbeat is slowing down. And that's a good marker of autonomic functioning. And here's the thing, people with low heart rate variability, where the timing between the heartbeats isn't in random. They're very, they can be very sick. They can be individuals, for example, if you look at the work by Paul Leherer, L-E-H-R-E-R, and uh, he's going back since the 1990s. Individuals with PSTD, post-traumatic PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, asthma, irritable bowel syndrome, anxiety, depression, hypertension, hypotension, so people who are mentally unwell and people who are physically unwell and people also with poor athletic performance, their HRV is not ideal. And it's through the breath that we can stimulate that. But one thing that people have said over and over again, and I know you will have seen it too, people who wear tape across their mouth mm -hmm. to ensure nasal breathing during sleep, that they will often comment that their HRV has increased automatically mm -hmm. just because of the improvement to the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. So it's about our everyday breathing, as well as our breathing during sleep. Mm -hmm. and, and generally the life quality. That's what yes. I see. Tape. Yeah. And, and uh, quite frankly, you know, I got a pretty early batch from you from the new tape. Yes. My tape, and I'm hooked. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. I, I love it very much. So Great, it's, thanks. 
it's it's when I'm out, I'm, it's kind of like hard to go back to the to the normal tape because it's very <laughs> rigid, and this one is lot lot more flexible. To be honest, now I'm, I'm not trying to hype here the the product, sure. but seriously, it's it's way different quality. So and especially, I understand your main uh, focus was the the children, children, the kids. Yeah. So so because of safety and because of uh, parents will not freak out. Let's put it yeah, this way. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I have it here. This and it was it was the children because what was happening was we had dentists who were in the best of intentions were encouraging their child patients to to wear tape and trying it different ways, not necessarily covering them out. Um, but like I had been asking children to cover their mouth and trying it different ways as well for 18 years and touch wood, we had no issues. But I always at the back of the mind was saying it's we have to think of something else here. But the tape is like that. So just to, for your viewers, it's stretchable and it's based on kinesio tape and the glue has been altered. It's cotton. Now this is the child size, so this is quite small. You stretch it by 30%. Mm -hmm. And it's the tension brought by the elastic tension which is helping to keep the lifts together. But then you can have a child who can wear this boat during wakefulness and during sleep. Yes. And there's no risk. And that's the key, but for parents, for adults as well. In actual fact, our first batch of tape, um, the, it was adults who bought more than children, which was a total surprise because at one point I wasn't even going to produce it for adults. It was primarily for kids. Sure. But how you, never, you can never predict how something goes, even when you work in the field. And again, I can testify that it's, it's pretty firm, but very flexible. So you can still talk, drink, whatever. Yes. Then yes. It, it definitely keeps the mouth shut, and it's more gentle than uh, the tape, mm -hmm. and it, on the lips, which is more sensitive than the the, the skin around it. Mouth. And yeah. uh, so that was my experience uh, first of all. So I'm I'm sold. Great. Thing, Great. Is there is there anything else that you are working on? It's it's public, or you are writing your book, and we'll see what we see. Yeah, no, it's, I'm writing a book and it's, this is a topics that we didn't include in the previous books. And I was always hesitant, you know, I knew that some Buteco instructors were putting it out there for diabetes. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can't put it out for diabetes unless I can show really a good connection there. And it was by accident, Peter. Um, Nick Keish was a, a guy from the United States. And I'm not sure what age he's probably he's in his 30s, but he sent me an email one day. He had read The Oxygen Advantage, and he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes since he was 12 years of age. And he started, like, he was very much into his health. This guy is a NASA-trained PhD scientist. So this guy is a pretty clever individual. He was very much into his food, into doing physical exercise, into everything. And it was when he started getting his mouth closed, taping his mouth during sleep, and slowing down his breathing, that he, he had the best control over his type 1 diabetes. Now... How has this not been out there? And then he did started some of the initial research looking at Bernardi, this Italian cardiologist who had been writing this for 20 years, and I'd missed it, um, but he picked it up. And then we started adding more material to it. So there's a chapter in diabetes. There's a chapter in epilepsy. There's a chapter on females breathing, which is now, the chapter alone is 14,000 words, so I have no idea where that's going to go. Uh -huh. that, Females are more prone to hyperventilation and breathing pattern disorders than main, men. Which again, and, we know for decades, but we... Yes. It's been, written, it's been written about since 1905 that sex differences in breathing. And there's a few things really to be coming into play there. It's really the influence of hormones and breathing. So during the monthly cycle is one. And I think it's the post-luteal phase or during the luteal phase, which I think in, off the top of my head is the second and third week. Of course, as a man, I, you know, I had to dig into this. I have no idea. And I'm still learning about it. But um, carbon dioxide levels can drop by 25%. So the, the female is hyperventilating at certain point every month for a period of time. And that's going to contribute to, like if you're hyperventilating, you've got an increased pain perception. You've got reduced oxygen delivery. Your sleep is impacted. And it was by chance. And I'll tell you how I went down that route. It was a musician that I was working with. who was a well-known band here in Ireland. And he started speaking about his fiance having PMS pains. 
And then, of course, yeah, I had read before that there's a connection there, but I didn't really go down that depth. And I said, sure, this is huge. I really need to look at this. And the research was there. So for females, um, there's another aspect looking at epilepsy, functional movement and functional breathing. Individuals who have poor breathing patterns have poor movement patterns, increased risk of injury. Sleep is a big one. And for children, craniofacial development. So I suppose it's those topics that I'm kind of broadening them out. And uh, yeah, it's going well. I'm currently, the book proposal is going to be written this week, hopefully, and into next week. So I, I, I wasn't uh, a big help for you when I sent this uh, six, seven research on, uh, uh, to you last week on, uh, on um, uh, intermittent hypoxia and fat loss, right? Because that could be another chapter. I'm sorry. Chapter, yes, of course. And another area, yeah, that, you know, I haven't really gone into that much either. But um, it's crazy because, you know, I, went, I did it because I was very much interested because somebody challenged me that, you know, I claimed it and yeah. uh, they were nuts. And I was like, no, 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 I have a few researches. And then, then I went after it and I found another 10. And, yeah, it, yeah. and, and then somebody, somehow it came to my mind, somebody told me, and I was tracking this down, that when they, um, the, the mountainers, they go into base camp, they, they lose crazy amount of weight. Uh, and I was like, okay, that's very interesting. So, uh, of course, because there is uh, generally a hypoxia and generally yeah. there is uh, uh, probably higher CO2, uh, what they produce. But that's what we see that even like some of the medical devices now, they're doing intermittent hypoxic training. Yes. Uh, if you read the, the benefits of the training, they see, they list fat loss. Yeah. Yeah. Is like how come? Yes. That's my question. Like, how come I cannot say buteco breathing is good for fat loss, but they, well, as a, you know, you know, say, but they can. They have a device. They can say it. Yes. Basically, I do the same thing, but they do. Small I breath. suppose this is because they have a quantified. I know. And but you know, we, you know it's, it's the do, it, d, d, yeah the dose and the duration we have to be considerate of, but. I was like, we put a chapter in the Oxygen Advantage book and that was on fat loss. And we talked about intermittent hypoxic training. But again, I was challenged on it as well. And I definitely, we've seen individuals over the years losing weight. I lost back in 2002 to 2005, a lot of weight to the point that my mother was driving me crazy because she was wanting me to put on more weight. So you I had to, to go to a potato? health food store. Hmm? <laughs> you had to eat more potato? I had, to, I had to start eating. I had to go back on dairy to, to bulk up. Um, otherwise, my, my mother would have, um, yeah. So one of those things I'm sure everybody experiences. But um, yeah, how can breathing improve a person's ability to reduce weight? And I think there's a number of different aspects to it. And I think it's a huge topic. One is sleep. I agree. Because with, in terms of ghrelin, and that's a, a hormone that promotes food appetite, that if you're having a really poor quality sleep, it produces more ghrelin and it, apparently it reduces leptin. So leptin and is a hormone. Insulin goes up. <clears throat> Say that again. And also insulin and, and blood sugar goes up and insulin goes up. Yeah. And as, and as a result, then that's going to promote that individual to eat more. So they put on more weight, but the increased weight then screws up their sleep. And this, it's a really vicious circle. It's amazing those vicious circles in the human body. And the other thing is stress. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a tendency that when people have a bad day and, you know, of course, probably doing it myself, you know, and in terms of if things haven't gone quite right, the first thing you do is you open up the fridge or whatever. Yes. So when you can help activate the body's relaxation response by slowing down the breath and with a higher control pause and with better sleep, the individual is more mindful, the individual is calmer, they've got a better ability to handle stress, and as a result, probably less likely to have to, to rely on food as comfort. You know, so there is a role, like can you think of all of the individuals who are on a path of losing weight continuously? And some of them will be plateauing, they're on a yo-yo diet, and they're not considering their sleep, and they're not considering their stress levels. How can you lose weight if you don't have good sleep and if you don't have a good ability to handle stress? Nice. And, and um, again, I digged up a, a bunch of uh, uh, researches from the past 
which not only talk about breathing or intermittent hypoxic training and uh, fat loss, that's one thing, but the other was controlling appetite, which is basically fat loss is happening through controlling appetite, right? So when you yes. say somebody is uh, going mindlessly opening the fridge and eating whatever is there, it's yeah. basically having an uncontrolled appetite. Yes. So, so my guesstimate is if we do intermittent hypoxic training when we are pretty hungry, then based on the research and experience of my clients, we can actually affect their appetite. So for some time, probably appetite is yes. pushed away because yeah. there's a different stress which is more important, which is survival. Excellent. Well done. Great point. So that would be my my thing. But um, yeah, yeah. a week ago, I had a I had a podcast with uh, Professor uh, Thomas Seifried, and he is one of the most uh, uh, respected cancer researcher on the field of uh, cancer as a metabolic disease, so not a genetic disease, but metabolic. And he is basically a beast on that on that field. And it was very interesting. We've been talking about the on oncogenic paradox, which is very briefly is like you know, cancer can become from many different directions. Um, different kind of carcinogenics and, uh, and toxins and, uh, and bacterium, virus, etc. Uh, and he mentioned also, it was very interesting, he mentioned just by the way, hypoxia, I'm like, oh, wait a second, we need to talk. And so he kind of talked about that very briefly. And he mentioned like, yes, it's, it's very simple that when the, the tissues are not getting enough oxygen, which is basic definition of hypoxia, there will yeah. be inflammation. And when there is inflammation, there will be on long term because the insult is getting as big, you know, it's basically getting as a wound. That's what he said. Like, you know, at one point it's a wound, doesn't heal. And that's what we call at one point cancer. And I was like, okay, that's very interesting. So I asked him, like, so if we make sure that the, the cells are getting, the right cells are getting the right amount of oxygen. So that can be as a prevention. And it was like, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good point. So what yeah. I'm trying to say here is there is a lot more benefits what we, what we can dig up from scientific researches, simply just using yes. critical thinking, right? Yeah, it would be amazing for research to take place in terms of the benefits of functional breathing and because of vasodilation, that there's improved blood circulation, mm -hmm. there's increased oxygen delivery via the Bohr effect, yes. and with increased oxygen delivery to the cells, could that be, could that mechanism be plausible? And I know that researchers have written, this was written about, I think it was by Warburg back in the 1930s, yes. um, that chronic hy that hypoxia to the tissue yes. and the link with cancer. Um, it would be an amazing piece of research for, for somebody to pick with that one up. See, see, again, when you say 20 years, you know, you said about an hour ago, like, you know, we are behind 20 years. We are not, we are not behind 20 years because, you know, uh, Dr. Mew is saying this for 50, not this, but other things for 50 yes. years. Warburg yeah. said it about, well, close to 100 years ago, if you, if you yeah. think about it. And where are we now? Are we any closer? I mean, yes. I asked Professor Siegfried, like, um, regarding to the war of cancer, 1971 from Nixon, are we winning yeah. this war? And he was like, no, we lost. I mean, we lost like 20 years ago. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah One thing, yeah. It's, it's very interesting. Um, I have another scientist uh, on board. I will have a podcast with him. His name is Dominic D'Agostino. And Dom is uh, um, also working with, uh, with Thomas Seyfried. So he knows a lot about this field. He is one of the leading ketone researcher in the world, so I'm very looking forward. And his PhD is from uh, breathing physiology. So I Great. wow, that's going to be amazing, really huh? Amazing. So I'm trying to pick his brain on that very subject, like if it's a yeah. any connections between a uh, uh, certain type of, uh, of course, uh, chronic hypoxia we are talking about, so not yeah. intermittent hypoxia. Yeah, yeah, and chronic so, hypoxia, we're really looking at it as a result of the impact of dysfunctional breathing, mm -hmm. chronic hyperventilation syndrome. And I know carbon dioxide, like carbon dioxide, a lot of doctors will, will refute the carbon dioxide, even though physiologically, carbon dioxide plays very important functions and roles in the human body. And um, 
I, you know, it, it's, again, that's where, could, could you imagine some pieces of research on that? So, yeah, so when, whenever you do that interview, please share it. No, I will, I will. And, and the, the, probably the other very interesting things that when you uh, mentioned HRV, and also breathing, I mean, Buteco breathing, we know that actually both are coming from the ex-Soviet Union, right? Yes. And pretty much the same time, we're talking about the 1950s, and pretty much the same location, which is the space program. And again, it's yes. not 2020. Where yeah. are we now? I mean, are we any closer? Yeah. So it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. And, and this is why my first question was, remember that I said, like, do you see more interest on breathing? Yeah, and that is why. Peter, there's breathing now is tosh. Yes. If you think about sleep, sleep has been talked about since the 16th century. Yeah. Um, written back in the 1800s, sometime 1870s or thereabouts, a book by George Caitlin called "Shut Your Mouth and Save Your Life." Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And he spoke yeah. about the American, the American Indians, the Native American Indians, that any time that the child was falling asleep with the mouth open the mother would gently press the lips together. Mm -hmm. So the information on sleep was around, but it was only in the last 15 to 20 years that doctors really started investigating sleep from a sleep disordered viewpoint. And now there are clinics everywhere. Now there's still a lot of individuals who have not been diagnosed. There's still much underdiagnosed. I think breathing now is the next one. Um, and I think it's happening. There's something happening. I've seen a trajectory 2002, it was very, very organically grown, just happening, just tipping away. And 2015 started increasing, 18 increasing, 19, and now the trajectory is up. So there's definitely something there. So I think it's great. And I think it's great for mankind because this is something that should have been tapped into and could offer so many potential benefits. And I'm not just saying that from a bias point of view. You have seen enough individuals, you've seen the benefits. I have seen enough individuals, I've seen the benefits. And it's relatively cost effective. Mm -hmm. And you never waste time focusing on your breathing. The impact on your mind, both from a psychological point of view and from a physiological point of view. And as you were talking about earlier, we were talking about the bi-directional relationship between different functions. I often use the example, the slide that we have from our oxygen advantage manual. And this is the interconnectedness with three of the main functions of the human body. We're talking about the effect of the emotions have. If we're stressed, it's going to make our breathing faster and harder. And faster and harder breathing feeds back into stress. But if we're stressed, we can't sleep well that night because we're twisting and turning. And if we have poor sleep, it affects our breathing. But also if you have poor sleep quality, you cannot have a calm mind. If your breathing is hard and fast, you snore, obstructive sleep apnea, and insomnia. So breathing is impacting sleep. Sleep impacts breathing. Breathing impacts emotions. Emotions impact breathing. And emotions impact sleep and vice versa. Yes. And one of those things, those are the three pillars that we should look in. Now, of course, there's a role for nutrition, all many, many other you know, approaches. But most certainly breathing was that one that was neglected for a long time. So um, we could do this for hours and hours. We could. <laughs> and hours. <laughs> I know ourselves. So first of all, thank you for your time mm -hmm. uh, today. Um, the other thing, thank you for your, your, you know, you're very generous with the information. And you, no, you don't have to say anything. I'm saying it. <laughs> But, but definitely, it's, you are a very good exam, example for somebody who has the information, still searching for the information, and, and willing to share the information for, for common good. So I, I'm very thankful for having a, a teacher like you. It's, it's, a, it's a great You're welcome. So, and I hope very soon we can see you in, in, uh, in Budapest for the next year uh, event when this yes. craziness is over. Yeah, always, always a privilege to travel to Budapest. Great city, love being there. So looking forward to it. Thank you very much again for the interview. Thanks, Peter. Thank you.